So um, using Gauss's law, Gauss's law has some interesting uses. Um, so let's first state what it is, right? Gauss's law says the net flux is equal to the integral around a closed surface of E dot n hat dA, and that's equal to the charge enclosed by this closed surface over epsilon naught. We kind of derived this from a point charge inside a sphere, and then we just generalized it from there based on the fact that um, the flux doesn't change in terms of leaving the surface. It doesn't matter what the shape of the surface is in the same way that it doesn't matter what the shape of a, of a, of a surface is that's containing, uh, that has a light bulb inside. The same amount of light is going to leave the surface, no matter if the surface is round or square. Um, so uh, we made some generalizations about this, but, but the, the, the summation is the net flux through a closed surface is the integral of E dot n hat dA, and that's equal to the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. So if there's no charge, there's no net charge enclosed, right? If the total charge inside adds up to zero, there could be loose positive and negative charges throughout, but if they add up to zero, then the, flux is, the net flux through the surface is zero. Um, and so this can be used in a variety of ways. We can, use to, we can use it to calculate flux, we can use it to calculate electric field, and we can use it to calculate charge. And so I'm just going to quickly give the reverse example of what we did yesterday. And I can say, look, we can derive Coulomb's law with this equation. Because we can say, look, um, consider a point charge. at the center of, of a sphere of radius r. So here's my sphere, right? And here's my point charge, we'll call it q, and this sphere has radius r. Right. I can actually use this, use this Gauss's law to determine the electric field at the surface of the sphere um, due to this point charge, right? And so here's how that works. We can see by symmetry that the electric field, because it's emanating from a, from a central, uh, from a charge at the center, that the electric field points outward at, uh, at every point on the surface, right? All I care is with Gauss's law is what's happening at the surface of the sphere, right? Because that's where this integral takes place. Similarly, the normal vector also points perpendicular to the sphere, right? That's the whole point of a normal vector, right? So it's normal to the surface, and so on. And so these two, the dot product of these two, E dot n hat, is just equal to E, right? Because they point in the same direction, and n has a unit length of 1. I could say it's E cosine theta. But that's just e because the angle between e and n is zero. They're all they're both pointing in the same direction, and so now I get Gauss's law becomes uh, the integral over a closed surface of e times dA, and that's equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught. Of course, we know in this case q enclosed is just q because that's the charge we said is inside. And now we can notice something else. We can say, look. Um, because this is spherically symmetric, the electric field has to have the same magnitude everywhere on the sphere, right? Everybody's at the same distance from the charge, so we don't expect any point to be uh, any any point on the surface to be any different in terms of the electric field it gets. So this integral becomes. Um, I'm going to drop. Well, I'll keep the phi net for a second. I can pull the, the, the electric field out because its, its magnitude is constant on the surface. We've already taken care of its direction. And so now if I just look at this part of the, equal, the equation, and I just want to, I, I can use this now to determine the electric field, right? This says that the electric field times the integral of the closed surface of D, over the closed surface of dA is equal to Q over epsilon naught. But the, in, but the integral of the closed surface of, of dA over the closed surface of the sphere is just the area of the sphere. It's 4 pi r squared. And so I get the, this is Q over epsilon naught. I get the electric field is equal to um, Q 
over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared or the electric field due to a point charge is kq over r squared which we already knew and so that's the coulombs that's the that's the coulomb that's the electric field due to a point charge so uh, we're going to use Gauss's law to determine the electric field due to an infinite line of charge. So if you remember when we first started looking at electric fields, we looked at electric fields due to point charges and then maybe a couple of point charges, and then we did a line and a surface and a volume, and, um, and uh, um, so, so uh, for the line of charge, we looked at a, a, a line of charge. Uh, we wanted to calculate the electric field at a distance z, so at this point p, a distance z from a line of charge length L with linear charge density lambda. And we derived this using calculus and integrating along the length of the wire. It was a little complicated. We got this formula, and we even showed how we got this formula. And so what I want to say is, look, if, uh, if uh, L is much, much greater than z, in other words, this length is much, much greater than this distance, then I can say, well, I can treat the line as kind of infinite. And that's a, that's a, 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 good, a good way to apply Gauss's law, which I'll show you in a minute. So I'm going to get from this formula the equation, the, the, the electric field for when L is very large, and then I'm going to show you we get that really simply with Gauss's law as well, the same answer. And so um, if we want to know what, what this thing looks like for very large values of L, it's kind of complicated because L is in the numerator and the denominator. As it gets large, it's hard to tell exactly what's happening. Um, so, so what I would do is I would uh, divide the top and bottom of this fraction by L, and that would give me k lambda times z over L times z squared plus L squared over 4 to the 1 half. Um, and uh, let's just look at the magnitude at this point. So I'll drop the k hat, I'll drop the vector direction. We, we know that, that it always points away from the wire. Um, and so now I'm going to bring this L inside, and this becomes k lambda over z times, and so this becomes an L squared when it's inside, and so I have z squared over L squared plus 1 over 4 to the 1 half. Right? And so this term for very large values of L squared uh, is negligibly small compared to this one. And so this becomes uh, becomes as L is much, much greater than Z, it becomes K lambda over Z um, times one fourth to the one half or two K lambda over Z. And so if we wanted to write that in terms of uh, epsilons, we'd say it's 2 over 4 pi epsilon naught times uh, lambda over z, or lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught z. Right. And so, so this is the electric field due to an infinite wire. A distance z away. And now I'm going to do the same thing using Gauss's law. So with Gauss's law, to derive the same thing, and remember I didn't have to do all the calculus to integrate along the line that we did earlier. Um, uh, I, I, normally I would have had to do that, but we had done it already and I just started with the equation we ended with in that integral. And I'm going to say, so I'll say using Gauss's law. And so here's my wire. And so what I'm going to do with Gauss's law is I'm going to choose a surface here. It looks like this. This is an imaginary surface. So this is my infinite wire that has charged, uh, charge density lambda. And I'm going to, this is, this is sort of a Gaussian surface. This is just what I imagine. It's called a Gaussian surface. And I'm going to use Gauss's law over that surface. 
the net flux through the surface is equal to the integral over that surface of the electric field at the surface times n hat dA integrated over the whole surface and that's equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. Sometimes you use a capital Q, sometimes I use a lower case Q, there's no... Uh, um, and so I'm going to pick a surface that has length L and I'm going to pick uh, 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 the cylinder radius here to be little r. And now I'm going to look at this uh, uh, shape and say, look, the electric field along this wire points away from the wire everywhere, right? If there's a charge along the wire, then it's just going to point radially away. If I was looking at down the wire, the electric field would be doing this, right? It would be pointing away in every direction. If I'm looking along the wire, right, the wire, the, the electric field is pointing this way, this way, right, out in every direction, but, um, and so for this, for this surface that I'm integrating over, right, I have to carry out this integral over the surface, and I have to be a little careful, but the, the normals to the surface are, all, are always, uh, you know, uh, perpendicular to the surface. So on the top and bottom, the, electric, the, the, the normals to the surface are this way, but, you know, if this is my, uh, what do I have that's round here? I have a cup that's kind of round, right? The electric, the, 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 uh, the normal vector points perpendicular to the surface, as does the electric field all the way around. So they point in the same direction this way. Notice that the, on the ends, the normal vector points outward, and the electric field still points this way. And so on the ends, um, E dot N hat is zero on the ends, but it's, it's, uh, the, the, the angle between them is, is zero on the, on, the, on the surface, on the curved part. And so E dot N hat is, is just E, on the curved part of the sphere and zero on the ends, right? Q enclosed is just equal to the uh, linear charge density times the length, right? It's just how much the, 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 the charge enclosed by my sphere is, uh, is equal to linear charge density times the length. It's whatever is along that wire there, right? And so now I can evaluate this. I can say um, the net flux is equal to, so the integral around the curved part, and that's just E times dA, plus the integral around the ends, and that's just E dot N hat is just zero, right? Because the electric field points this way, or that way, or this way, but the normal on the ends points out, and so the dot product of them is zero, right? And so that's equal to Q and that's equal to lambda times L. We can also notice that since I picked the cylinder to be centered on the wire, right? That's my R there. Um, that the electric field is going to be constant all the way around. It's a symmetric situation, and so there's no reason to expect the electric field to be different at any part of this curved part of the surface. And so I can say my phi net is just equal to E times the integral over the curved part times dA. Um, and that's equal to lambda over the length, times the length. Right. Well, well, what is the area? This is just the area of the curved part, right? And so I'm going to just going to take this part of the equation and write it over here and say, look, um, e is equal to, sorry, E, uh, the integral of dA is just the surface area of the curved part. Well, it's, that's 2 pi r times the length, right? 2 pi r is the circumference of this circle. So the surface area of the curved part of the cylinder is the circumference times the length. If you, if you took a, a cylinder, the surface, and cut it open at one side and laid it out, it would be length times width. And when you unrolled this part, the, curve, the, the round part, it would be 2 pi r, and then, and then uh, uh, the other side would be the length, 2 pi r l 
um, oops, I left an epsilon naught, sorry. It was Q over epsilon naught, right? Q is lambda L, so I have an epsilon naught here and an epsilon naught here. I lost something there for a second. Lambda L over epsilon naught. The L's cancel. And so now I get E is equal to lambda over 2 pi r epsilon naught, which is just what I got from the other version. Um, but I, had, I started just from the basic Gauss's law here. I didn't have to do the integral that we started with before. Um, I got to this expression, um, which took several steps for the, for, the, um, for the Coulomb's law version of the integration to get that electric field. Um, uh, and this was just a lot simpler. So we want to use Gauss's law to determine the electric field at distance z from an infinite plane carrying a surface tar charge density sigma. And so we've got uh, an infinite plane here. I know my drawing isn't infinite, but pretend it is. Right? And we want to know what the electric field is some distance z above the plane. Right? And so this is a distance z right, above the plane. Um, and so uh, we want to be able to uh, um, use Gauss's law. And so Gauss's law, as you know, is the net flux is equal to the integral over a surface, closed surface, of E dot n hat times dA. And that's equal to the charge enclosed by, by my Gaussian surface over epsilon naught. And so we want to pick a surface. I'm going to change this drawing just a little bit. We want to pick a surface that um, that uh, a Gaussian surface. It can be anything we want, right? I'll put my electric field in the middle of my writing, and uh, it's distance z above the surface. Z, right? Um, uh, so that this integral is doable. We want to pick a Gaussian surface so that. You know, what we're after is, uh, is a geometry of a surface so that along the surface of the, of, the, of the shape, the electric field is constant and either parallel or perpendicular to the, uh, the normal vector to the surface, right? And so for this case, um, because the electric field uh, uh, above the surface is always going to point up away from the surface, and below the surface it's going to point down, right? So the electric field everywhere is going to point up, 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 or below it's going to point down. Then we want a Gaussian surface that's, um, that's flat on top, so that the normal to the surface also points straight up. And so we might pick like uh, a cylinder like we did for a wire, except this time we put the flat end on top and we run the cylinder through the through the sheet, and then it's got the, another flat end on the bottom, so the curved ends, ooh, that's not a very good drawing. Let me try that better. All right, so it goes like that. And so the flat ends are at the top, so that the, uh, the electric field and the normal force are in the same direction, and the curved ends are on the sides, where the normal vector goes this way, or say that way, right? But the, uh, say it goes through the surface there, right? But the, uh, but the electric field is, is always uh, perpendicular to the plane, so it's parallel to the surface, so it's perpendicular to the normal. So that when you do an integral over this closed surface, the only thing it contributes is the ends, because those are the places where E and N hat are parallel, are, are parallel and on the sides, E and N had are perpendicular. And so if I want to evaluate this integral to determine the electric field, phi net is equal to, so the integral of E dot N hat dA over the N's plus the integral of E dot N hat dA over the curved parts or the sides, whatever you want to call it, is equal to QN closed over epsilon naught. Right? Um, and so this guy is just zero because E on the sides is perpendicular to N hat. 
and so this is the only one that counts and so I get phi net is equal to the integral of E times dA over the ends right and that's equal to QN closed over epsilon naught well since I'm at the same distance on the ends from the surface everywhere the E is just a constant and so this becomes phi net I don't even need to be carrying this along because I'm not actually doing anything with this guy I'm just calculating the electric field is equal to E times the integral over the ends of dA and that's equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught right well if the ends have area A and A that means they cut the plane also with area A right and that means Q enclosed which is just the charge density times the area is just uh, it's just exactly that. It's the charge density times how much area is enclosed by the by the cylinder, and uh, and the area of the ends is just two a. So e times two a. That's the integral of dA over the two ends. Is equal to sigma. I was using a capital A times the area over epsilon naught. The a's cancel, and I get the electric field is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. This is actually in very good agreement with what we got when we calculated the electric field due to a, uh, um, a, a, a disk of charge um, and we made the approximation that, the, that we were very very close to the disk so the disk appeared infinite. For that case um, We did this by multiple by, by integration really, and we got the electric field is equal to one or four pi epsilon naught times you just have to go back and look um, two pi sigma times uh, minus um, two pi sigma z over the square root of r squared plus z squared. That was the electric field. Notice that if we're letting the plane become infinite, so this was the case with the disk of radius r and we were at a distance to z above it, right? Um, if we let as r becomes much much greater than z, this term just goes away because this just becomes uh, essentially proportional to 1 over r as r gets much much larger than z and this term doesn't change at all and we get e is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught which agrees with this guy and so in the limit as our disk gets very large or as we get very very close to it as we get close to our disk um, we see the same answer between these two which is good so here's another problem. It says consider a solid sphere of radius r. So you know some kind of insulating material um, carrying a uniform charge density rho. So it's just it's just a solid sphere, right? It's got a radius r. I can draw a little lower so I can draw some or draw around it. All right? It's got a radius r and it's got a uniform uh, surface charge density rho. I'm determined E inside and outside the sphere. So, so we'll have R less than R and R greater than R. We'll want to know the electric field. And so let's start by uh, looking at R greater than R. And so we want, to the, we want to know the electric field out there somewhere, right? That's our R. And so we're going to use Gauss's law. And so here's Gauss's law, the net flux is equal to the integral over a closed surface of E 
dot n hat da, and that's equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught. And and q enclosed is just equal to the density times the volume of the sphere, right? Uh, the volume of the sphere is uh, v is equal to four thirds pi r cubed, and so q enclosed is equal to rho times uh, four thirds pi r cubed. If I want to use that, right, and then I can say so. Uh, so in order to evaluate this integral, I need to pick a surface uh, to evaluate the integral over. I want to calculate the electric field, and I'm going to use Gauss's law to do it. And it always seems a little bit, bit weird to be using something to calculate the integrand, right? That's what we're usually doing with Gauss's law. We're, often we're using it to calculate electric fields rather than fluxes. You can also use it to calculate the flux, but usually we want to use it to calculate an electric field and so usually we're finding some region where the electric field is constant, playing it outside the integral, evaluating the integral, and moving it to the other side and solving for E. And that's what we're going to do here as well. Since we want to know E at a point out here, and we know spheres are real symmetric, we're going to pick our integral surface, we call it the Gaussian surface, right, as the sphere of radius little r, which is greater than big R. I see you can probably tell what we're going to do for this one as well, right? And so, um, so uh, a couple of things we notice. First of all, the electric field, because of this spherical charge distribution and the symmetry of the shapes, it's going to point outward everywhere, conveniently in the same direction as our, as our normal vector, right? E and n hat point in the same direction everywhere. I'll just write it that way then, rather than writing a whole bunch more n hats and so on. And so um, this becomes the integral of, over the closed surface of E dA. Um, is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Well, uh, also by symmetry, no point looks any different than any other point for the symmetry of this, and so I can say the electric field is going to be constant, and so now it's just the integral of dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. Um, the, the integral of dA is just the area of the surface. This is just 4 pi times little r squared, right, is the surface, is the area of the Gaussian surface. And so e times 4 pi r squared is equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught, or e is equal to uh, q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, or kq over r squared. So if I'm outside the sphere, I can just treat it as a point charge. It gives the same electric field that a point charge gives. And that's kind of what we expect, right? Because the electric field looks like the same electric field that would come from a point charge that was smaller. I could just treat all the mass of the, all the charge of the sphere as being at a center point once I'm outside the sphere. And so it's kind of what we do with gravity, right? We treat gravity as though it's all concentrated at a single point at the center. Um, it works the same way with electric fields. And so once again, we've sort of re-derived the Coulomb electric field for a point charge. It's just saying that when you're outside a sphere of charge, you can treat it as a point charge. So now let's ask what happens when we're inside, right? And so I'm going to erase all my work here. I guess I should erase the whole diagram too, right? And now I'm going to say, well, well what if what about the case where r is less than r? And so um, I'm going to redraw my, my charge distribution again. I'm going to draw a little bigger maybe. Right? This is my r. Right? But now I'm going to look at a, at, a, at, a, at a point inside. So I want to know what the electric field is here at some distance, little r, which is less than big r. And so once again, I'm going to pick a Gaussian surface. Wow, that was bad. All right, anyway, hopefully you get the idea. Um, goes through this point. Maybe I'll move the point a little bit so it looks like it's more on my little red circle. So I have a Gaussian surface inside. 
and once again I get uh, I get the net field the, the net flux is equal to the integral over the closed surface again it's the surface that I pick it's this one I picked it for a reason of e dot n hat da is equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught now q enclosed is what's enclosed by my surface earlier it was the whole sphere but now it's not that right now it's the density times the volume enclosed which is equal to the density times four thirds pi little r cubed right that's the volume of the little red sphere right and so that's different to what i had before when my when my uh calcium surface was out here and i had four pi big r cubed and so um uh, and so once again I'm going to make symmetry arguments. So I'm going to say look the electric field either points outward or inward but it doesn't point laterally um, and so uh, if this is positively charged I'm expecting my electric field to point outward and so I get um, I get the integral of uh, over my closed surface of uh, of E times dA is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught and this just becomes the integral uh, e times the integral because by symmetry again my electric field is going to be going to be constant around the surface I can't expect the electric field to be any different in magnitude here than here they're both in the same relative point on a sphere and so their magnitude should be the same da that's an argument we make a lot but it's just based on the symmetry of the problem right you wouldn't expect an electric field on uh, this this point really is is uh, geometrically indistinguishable from this point and so the physics shouldn't be any different at the two points you can't identify uh, any property at, at one point or another on this circle that makes it any different from the other so they'd all have to have the same electric field and so this is equal to uh, again q enclosed or epsilon naught and so now the my surface now in this case I get e uh, times the integral of, of the surface is 4 pi little r squared not 4 pi well it's still 4 pi little r squared like it was in the previous example it's this area of this red circle red sphere right that's equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught or e is equal to q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared what's interesting about this is if we is this time if we break this down q enclosed is this and so we get e it's equal to, if I substitute in this guy now, rho 4 thirds pi little r cubed, before this was big r cubed, and uh, it was just another constant, and so it didn't matter. But here, the, the, the charge that's enclosed varies with how big, with how far from the origin my point is. And so this is over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. Notice these two guys cancel, and that leaves me with an r there. The 4 pi's cancel. And I get the electric field is equal to, uh, sorry, rho r over 3 epsilon naught. That is to say that the electric field increases with r. And by the way, it only depends on the charge that's enclosed, right? This, this charge that's enclosed, notice the charge that's outside doesn't have any effect on what the electric field is. The electric field just depends on what's inside. And so if this was a hollow sphere, which we'll do at some point, um, and it was full of charge, and you were inside the hollow sphere, then you're, you can pick a Gaussian surface that's enclosing no charge, and you'll have no electric field inside. And so this is how we know that the electric field inside, inside a closed surface is zero if there's no charge enclosed in the surface. So, so our electric field is zero at the center, right? And it goes all the way up to, um, at, at the surface of the sphere, is, uh, it's just gonna be uh, uh, rho times four pi r squared, where r is capital R, and that would get us back to uh, kq over, over little r squared for, for outside. So notice that we could say, look, um, the two will agree, right? So these two cases will agree at the surface for 
So if I just if I stick in this is this is little r. Sorry, if I stick in uh, at little r equals r, this equation becomes um, e equals rho r over three epsilon naught. But rho, the charge density, is just a total charge q over uh, four thirds pi r cubed. Right. That's the that's the where, where q is the total charge on the sphere. Right. This is just equal to um, if I substitute that in q over four thirds pi r cubed, right? I'm substituting that into rho times r over 3 epsilon naught. One of the r's cancels, the 3's cancel, and I get its q over 4 pi. Uh, this becomes a squared epsilon naught r squared, which is what the other equation, the equation we got from this guy, would, would be when little r is equal to big r, and so they meet at the surface.